Take it away, Phil. Oh, me? Right. Oh, yeah. How do you even do an intro? I haven't done it in so long. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome to APIs You Won't Hate. I don't know what episode number this is or what day it is, but thank you for coming along. That's what we like to hear. It's perfect. Yeah. Do you want to do the intro? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you better believe I'm going to use that. I haven't done it in ages. Matt was doing it forever, and then you did it. And uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just along for the ride half the time. Yeah, I, it's just your velvety narrator voice, Phil, that the people come for. Whoa, whoa, why don't we do it this way? Uh, welcome to APIs You Won't Hate for the second time. My name is Mike Bifulco. I am one of the co-runners of APIs You Won't Hate. I'm hanging out here today with Phil Sturgeon and our good pal Steve McDougal from Treble. So, Phil, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. I spent the whole morning out and about in the woodlands to my knees in mud, which is my happy place. Now I get to talk about APIs, which is my other happy place. So I'm excited that we got Steve along today. Thanks for coming, Steve. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Obviously, I've been a long time listener. New in uh, the kind of public facing API world right now. So, uh, I'm excited to, to have a chat about APIs. Yeah. Well, uh, we're to have you here. Why don't we start this way? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, where do you work? What have you been working on? How did you get here? Yeah. So I live in South Wales, and I believe my house is probably going to get turned into trees by Phil at some point soon. Uh, but yeah, I've been in the API space for maybe six, seven years, heavily on the PHP side using Laravel, Slim. Uh, you've been using Framework X, which is really fast asynchronous framework. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of uh, a lot of talks around APIs. I do a lot of talks around integrating with APIs. With a focus on kind of quality and scaling out the complexity. And my day to day has basically been building lots of tooling around APIs. So I'm in that API headspace. So you've just started uh, working at Treble, right? And I, I've come across Treble a bunch of times. I was on one of their Twitter circles a while ago. And I think I chatted to them like right when they were starting out, but ages ago. And they do a bunch of stuff. So yeah. in a similar way to a lot of the tooling vendors, there's there's so many different parts of the API lifecycle. Most tooling vendors don't want to just do one bit. They want to try and do a few. And so yeah. you guys have got an interesting different set mostly with some overlap with stoplights. So I kind of bounced around Treble a little bit then. But we've got to mention that uh, Treble in the past have sponsored the podcast, but I don't listen to the podcast, so I don't know what they said about it. So. <laughs> So can you explain to me what's what's going on with Treble? Yeah, so we are currently scaling. We're hiring more engineers to help us build out better and higher quality tools, building out more tooling. And we're, we're basically what you, yeah, Google Analytics, but for your API, that is the best way to explain what Treble is to most people. You could go into the observability, into the monitoring and explain all of that aspect of it. But I've always found the easiest way to explain it is just it's like google analytics for your api okay nice and looking at it just bouncing around the home page i mean the, the api monitoring and observability stuff looks to me a little bit like new relic but kind of api focused yeah similar okay yeah very similar one of our, one of our clients i'm working with at the moment kind of described us as a log rocket but for their api they use log rocket on the front end and they're now currently trying out us on their APIs. So interesting. Okay. And then so you've got the monitoring, but then it kind of moves into auto-generated API docs. How how does yes. that work? So basically every request that you make, we log, we do ETL script on it to make sure that we're pulling out data, standardizing data formats, and adding it into our database. And while we're doing that, we're triggering lots of events to start building up paths and endpoints and query parameters and merging query parameters and we're just kind of merging and mangling data in the background to build out an open API spec, basically. Nice. That's pretty cool. There's there's a few people doing that now. Like I, the last post I just did the other day on on APIs you won't hate blog was about using Optic to do that, which is a slightly different cool. approach. You you run a CLI script and then basically man in the middle whatever API you feel like yeah. man in the middling. I was doing it for the Mastodon API, which is pretty cool. But this this would be kind of implemented by the API developer team or the sysops team or something. You just kind of shove that in. Yeah. Or uh, no, it, it's not done at the server level. It's not like a proxy. It's done as like an SDK. How does it how does it yeah. get that data? Oh well, we we uh, we've got an SDK as well, and basically it's just a a piece of middleware that 
will capture the request a response and then on the kind of termination of the script we gather the data and send that off to our api to then be processed so it's yeah it's a middleware basically so one of the benefits that i found is that you can choose what endpoints you want to add it to you can right. add it to all of them add it to some of them and you can slowly roll it out to make sure that you know you're getting the data you need and because we are in a, we're enabling field masking uh, that gentler rollout is sometimes recommended because sending over mm-hmm. passwords credit card numbers email addresses all of those sorts of things in a monitoring solution you don't want so with our field masking every request and response goes through this masking process where we turn the value into stars of the same length, roughly, so that you're still getting the understanding of that data, but you're not passing that data, which keeps things a lot cleaner for you. There's no mm-hmm. kind of data privacy worries about, are they going to know my passwords? And it, it does that with the headers as well. So you 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 kind of, we're masking all the different auth headers that you might have and custom auth headers as well. So. Okay, that's pretty smart to find it. I guess it's looking for like X hyphen API key and X hyphen authentication token as well as everything yeah. else. But we we basically got a big list of different ones, uppercase, lowercase, spelt wrong, not spelt wrong. And so just to try and <laughs> gather all of them basically. Access token. Um Yep. Fantastic. Okay, that sounds really handy. I, I like I like the idea of it being a a middleware, and I like that there's different people doing different approaches. Because I know yeah. I wrote about Akita turning your HTTP traffic into Open API as well, and there's a few more steps yeah. of indirection involved there. Because again, Akita is like a whole platform that does a bunch of different parts of the puzzle, and then you kind of export the Open API out, and they just added like a nginx module, so you can really cool. wedge it in a, a production. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, but that that seems complicated and something that a lot of people can't necessarily yeah. do in certain hosting environments anyway. So, Yeah, we're looking at different options at the moment as well. Like I was talking to one of our other DevRels the other day about could we create our own custom ingress for Kubernetes so that mm. we can just capture specific parts and then it's not handled within the web request. It's handled within the, the, the Kubernetes engine itself. We'll then send that data to us but you yeah. know, that, that's probably something down the road once we've hired a few more people, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there was another approach that I think a previous job I was talking about trying to build this. I think Stoplight was trying to do it and WeWork was trying to hack it. But we were talking about trying to, because we've got um, the Prism proxy, right? And that in yeah. previous versions, Prism proxy was doing some learning. It's not doing learning anymore. And it does do a bit of like content validation to go like, oh, that's bad. You did an error, whatever. I'm telling on you. And, and all of that stuff, we only ever really got it as far as working in development and staging because we didn't really have the confidence in the production performance to say like, hey, yeah. go wedge this into the critical path and I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, yeah. And so we were kind of recommending a few bigger customers. You can do like traffic cloning or like yeah. traffic shadowing. I can't remember what it's called. So you basically in, in Kubernetes somewhere say like, look, for all these requests coming through, take one in a hundred of them and just like fire them over this way as well. And then you just make sure yep. the database doesn't do anything and you have to build like a separate environment that's just like a, yeah. a castrated version of the real production. It just sounds like a lot of juggling just to get that simple yeah. kind of logging effort, right? Exactly, yeah. But then on the other hand, like with, with your SDK, it's super simple because it's just in the code there, but then that's still kind of slowing things down. Although if it's after the person got their JSON, maybe that doesn't matter. So there's there's like a bunch of yeah. different ways, of like pros and cons of, of how to get that stuff. And yeah, definitely, they're all bad. That's one of the struggles that I'm working on this week. Actually, uh, I was working with uh, people from React PHP, working on asynchronous middleware. So mm-hmm. what I can do is I can send a HTTP request asynchronously in PHP, and while that's running, I can return that response and then deal with any failures Smart. within that asynchronous process itself. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's what you want. I mean, yeah, obviously I have yeah. no idea how the SDK works, but that <laughs> that sounds like a good approach. Um, Currently not like that, but I'm going through this refactoring as at the minute yeah. where I'm looking at our P- the PHP ecosystem for our SDKs to make sure we support a wide bunch of frameworks as, as well as, you know, PSR 15 middleware as well. So those kind of build your own. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to assess all of it 
to try and figure out what the best approach is so that I'm not forcing dependencies on any one framework. Yeah, so it, sure. it's been a juggle. Definitely. Well, I'm guessing I'm guessing that a lot of the different SDKs in different languages will work differently as well. So I'm, you know, we're yeah. probably by default talking about PHP without really mentioning it there because that's our backgrounds. Yeah. yeah. But I'm sure I'm sure like the node one is asynchronous by default or whatever. So yeah. Yeah. Just gotta try and find different ways to make it work Id idiomatically or whatever the correct word is. I just, yeah. I just do tree stuff now. I forget words. <laughs> <laughs> I forget words. I just know birch <laughs> concepts. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Steve, I'm a little bit curious about um, user benefits of uh, adding yeah. Treble to your system. So a uh, comparison before between Treble and uh, Log, right? Sort of the Log Rocket for your yeah. APIs. Um, I used Log Rocket before and I'm, I'm a big fan of it for the applications that I build for the web and whatnot. Um, assuming I had never been exposed to Log Rocket before, what the heck does that mean? What do I yeah. get? So what you get is you can have multiple projects, obviously. Um, Maybe you've got internal APIs, external APIs, and you want to kind of keep all of them, you know, separate. We capture the request, the response, the response time, request time, the total load time, so that you can start to see where perhaps you're getting issues in that API lifecycle, in that request response lifecycle. We capture bugs. We capture that full kind of stack trace from the exception and handlers, so that you can see bugs that are introduced and this is like over time for example so let's say you do a big feature deployment and it breaks a couple of endpoints you can kind of pinpoint that back down through tracing through the requests seeing where those errors were back on it was starting to be introduced and we're, we're looking at building out a, a, you know, a fully fledged alerting system as well and enabling you to ignore certain errors within your api for example with with laravel for example if I return a 422 from Laravel, it means that my validations failed in Laravel world. Hmm. That's currently being reported as a problem. However, it's technically not an API problem, it's a user problem. So we're looking at extending our SDK to say that you can ignore specific exceptions. Yeah. So that they aren't reported as an actual problem because it's a user problem or an implementation problem, not a API problem as such. Right, yeah, and I guess when you're trying to assess how your um, system is running uh, when working as they should, you yeah. want to report that as a problem. You to... Yeah, you don't want to report that someone's trying to register again using the same email address as a API problem, right? Because it's not, it's, it's a human problem at that point. I think it's interesting too that um, you're getting a bunch of information in addition to just whether things are working or failing or crashing, whether you're getting errors and things like that. Yeah. Especially in a world where people are starting to talk way more about uh, between typical Lambda serverless functions and edge functions and yeah. all that. Uh, there's sort of like technical debt creep that can happen where your are um, can become slow and slow can be the problem, not failing, right? You're yeah. things can start to feel like they're kind of creeping along and having some sort of intelligence behind the scenes to be able to track like, hey, which calls are getting slow? Uh, help your engineering yeah. teams to to trace that all down. Um, yeah, yeah, massively. I'm I'm currently working with our engineering team at the minute to implement a re-architected approach to how we're logging things so that we're going to have much more intelligence on the reports that we can generate. So, yeah, you can pinpoint the exact request, when it was, why it was, what happened, and a lot more. And we're also jumping on that bandwagon of GPT and saying, okay, so what can we actually... <laughs> What what could we what information can we get from AI on this? What, mm. Yeah, we we've obviously got a lot of generating going on for building out an open API spec. Is there any way that we could improve upon that? Of so, course, and behind the scenes, those GPT uh, are really good at noticing patterns that are probably not uh, apparent to you and me. Uh, that's yeah, that's a exactly. superpower in itself. Imagine when adding Treble to your service, actually one of the things I saw on your site earlier, I was kind of browsing around, is that I think you get something like 50 data points for every API call uh, as part of the kind of analytics end of this. Um, it feels like a lot, right? Like that can be imposing at first. Yeah. If, you're, if you're working with a team that's just adopting Treble, like what are some of the first things you tell them to look for or look at or optimize for when they're working with it? To be honest, I've not worked with many people onboarding who have asked questions. I've only been here three weeks the only thing I've dealt with so far is uh, talking about, you know, how much of a bottleneck is it going to cause with it being middleware and mm. sending a request? I had to explain that it's terminating middleware, so it's at the end of that PHP CGI process. 
or you know FPM process. Right. It triggers a terminate command, and then that middleware triggers. Talked about data leakage and using the mast fields. To be honest, uh, the hardest thing is getting people to understand what it gives you. Mm. When it's just like, well, I know I'm sending a request, I know I'm getting a response. I, you know, I could probably generate uh, an open API spec using an open source tool. But what that isn't telling you is what's being used, how much it's being used, which is the most popular endpoints, which is the slowest endpoints, where it's where your request body is starting to get a little bit too excessive. Should you start introducing JSON API specification so that it can tweak that payload coming back a little bit more because your response size is getting a little bit too big and taking a little bit too long. So yeah, there's there's lots of things we have to do when we're onboarding people to explain what you can do and how to get the most out of it. And part yeah. of my job is to record and create content around that as well. So I w- I'm going to be creating videos around, I'm going to build a really bad API for fun and <laughs> stick it through treble and see how much I can improve it based on just using those insights instead of me using my brain and thinking, oh, I know this is going to be a problem. I'm going to take that. I might even get someone else to join me on it and get them to do it <laughs> because I know that habits can die hard and just see how much improvements we can get on an API based off of just that insight. As a consultant in APIs and as a like someone who's worked on dev tools, I have this really interesting kind of thing where I'm we're building these dev tools to try and solve problems and then the people don't necessarily know that they need them because they've just got shit yeah. breaking. If, if some shit's breaking and some stuff's going slow, then they're like looking at some exceptions and saying, oh, you should probably fix that. And it's very much like, a, how do we fix the problem that happened? Uh, yeah. But then they don't really, I've worked with so many teams that don't really recognize there's so much more than just the code exceptions. Like you get some exceptions or you yeah. get some slowness, or you might not even know it's going slow. Like how do you know that something was slow or someone complained about it? Well, how many customers did you lose before they complained? Um, yeah, and then exactly. even when they do complain, you're just like, well, I don't know, it seems all right to me. And you get some really weird scenario where it's like it a problem on the first machine. of the month or something. Yeah. And so, or there's this like, we've had this crazy thing where, you know, uh, one cron job would run at like, you know, once a month and then requests would be really slow then. So someone would complain about the API being slow and then you check it out tomorrow. You're like, nah, it's fine. You're mad. So that being able to look back in time and see that kind of the performance, just graphs and stuff are super handy. Yeah. But then people don't know that they need that because if you're, like I said, if you're getting complaints, you 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 want to try and treat the the symptom or the well no, you want to try and treat the specific problem at the time and not really think yeah. about the larger. You want to you want to treat the cause, not the symptoms, right? Yeah, yeah, it's been so, a tricky one. You know, before I started down this journey of API monitoring and observability stuff, yeah, you know, the typical approach would be, oh, I don't know, I'll install Sentry and I'll get all my error logs. And I'll enable performance monitoring, and if anything notifies me, I'll deal with it. But that's yeah, you got to sometimes you got to take that proactive approach when you're trying to build a good product, right? You got to proactively search for ways to improve what you've got. If if you're not building new features, you're improving what you've got. So it's just a tool to enable you to do that. At the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I basically lived in New Relic and when at previous jobs, and it it seems like this would be more useful than that because it, it's more targeted APIs. I had to kind of convince yeah. it to, to to tell me what I wanted a lot of the time. And I'm sure they've changed in the years since I've used it. But yeah, like that was my my job as kind of API governance before API governance existed was just yep. to snoop around New Relic and see what was happening. And and the development teams maintaining those APIs would, if there was an, an error or you know something bad in the logs, they would they would usually get told about it and they would usually fix it. But it was it was trying to find all the things that weren't weren't problems yet, things that were on their way to being problems. Yeah, know, and uh, the problem endpoints. with things like that is that you're not spotting trends, are you? You're just seeing, oh, it took fifty two milliseconds to do that. It took this long to do that. It was doing this. Here's a SQL query that was ran, and you know you're not seeing, okay, this response payload's huge, or this response load time is increasing. You're not seeing yeah, that absolutely. information when you're just kind of scrolling through performance metrics and Sentry or New Relic or anything like that. Right. And so is that what the treble API score is all about, is, is trying to remove some of that, like trying to guess at what's good or bad and just basically saying that's bad. Yeah, basically. That. <laughs> that's kind of cool. 
how and I, how I'm does, currently how building work? out uh, monthly reports at the moment as well, so that you can see, you know, for because I used to be an engineering manager, one thing that was important to me was, you know, what is our performance like over the last month? Has it gone up or down? Is the low time going up or down? Is this an issue? Memory consumption being increased to see, you know, sometimes a PR slips through that causes a bug that you don't know about. Maybe it uses more memory. Maybe it locks the database for X amount of seconds. You with yeah, you don't see that unless you can kind of get that holistic overview on, you know, the last 30 days your response time's gone up by X percent. Your yeah, load time's gone up by this. That's really interesting because I think again in when I've worked on this sort of thing, people like look at the graph and look at the response time. I mean, the, yeah. the classic new relic graph of like median time. So it's not even, it's not even showing yeah. you the percentiles. It's just like on average, it looks fine. And, and even then yeah. kind of looking at a graph and <sighs> depends on how thick your glasses are and whether you can spot the fact that it's gone up by 2% yeah. over the last month. Especially and if like... they, don't, yeah, they, don't, they don't allow <laughs> you to zoom on the graph. So it's like yeah. you're looking at 30 days and you can't really tell that much. Exactly. So like if, if your application is getting slower by 2% every month or whatever, there's going to be some serious trouble in a couple of months. And, and that's very yeah, hard to exactly. spot just by looking to graph. So if you can kind of let people know that sort of trend, that's really helpful. Yeah. It's that, again, it's that taking the metrics and spinning it into something that's a little bit more proactive for someone that they, they can act upon and not just have to search to try and find because they may not think of it. Yeah, that's cool. On the topic of API scores, it's something that we, we always talked about doing with uh, Spectral, and I don't know what they're up to these days, I don't work there now, but uh, the idea of an API score we were going for, we were working on like looking at open API and then judging your API on that and saying like, yep. um, oh, uh, this is inconsistent, this breaks these rules. It's kind of the opposite of linting. Instead of saying, here are problems, it just kind of says, you don't have any problems or you're an A++ API. Yeah. And it, it really makes me want to get back to it because if you can have a design score and then like a performance score that would be super cool i'm actually i was working on that not last week the week before i spent literally the whole week going through every page of the open api specification converting that to data objects so that i can pass an open api spec pass it in and start to do calculations on you know data that i actually know and understand my eyes were you know very kind of bleeding by the end of the week once I'd finished building all of it. But yeah, it was, um, it's coming. We're, we're currently doing, cool. we've got a big list of metrics, which we're going to check against once we've got that open API spec. And what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to release that part as a free tool. Okay. So it'll be under like, once it's built, it'll be like insights.treble.com and you can either pass the URL to your open API spec, paste it in or upload the file. And what we'll do is we'll build, pass and give you a score and give you kind of, here are the problems. Here is where you're doing well. Nice. Things like, are you using RESTful patterns? Yes. Uh, authentication percentage and all those sorts of things. That's and that'll cool. be a, a free tool for people to just use. Do you guys have any sort of, do you folks have any sort of like, green tech ideas in your in your roadmap because i would love to talk to some of you folks about that if not it, it's something that's on my mind uh, i'm very much aware that a platform like ours which deals with analytics can quite easily increase carbon usage by you know mm. a new client coming on board who's got a very busy api suddenly our carbon footprint goes from x to x plus seven yeah. I'm definitely looking at what the options are for that. And we are currently having discussions internally about how our application works, how it performs, and what we can do to kind of shrink that a little bit. That's really interesting. That's that's less less what I meant, but really interesting all the same. What I mean is uh, knowing and doing something about the carbon footprint of your organization and your application you may work is a good thing. That's kind of uh, making tech green. Uh, but yeah. kind of helping other people make their tech green is something that, that Treble or any analytics software could really help with. Like I've toyed around with the idea for yeah. ages of coming up with some sort of tool, some sort of proxy that would just look at all the traffic coming through and be like, you could have put a cache header on that. It's been exactly the same yeah. 99% of the time. What are you doing? 
and there's a bunch of other like tweaks and suggestions you could make to people like if if someone's making the same request over and over again you could even just say like you know that could be a head request or, or there's a lot of different stuff yeah and i think that that could be really powerful for an analytics company i mean you, we have those show... sorts of that information already so so yeah. as it'll be something you know I, i'd speak to the designer and say okay can you design something cool so that on a project or on an endpoint i can add a badge and say you know you've got a green bonus which boosts your api score <laughs> yeah our, you know, our that, that sort that. of thing to yeah. say you know you're actually using caching you're limiting your response size you, you know you're, you're following a practice which is perhaps more green than i'll just make another api request <laughs> exactly yeah that's something that i think we're going to talk about a lot more of as a few guests that i'm lining up to to talk about more green yeah. tech stuff in depth. I know that you kind of looked into it a bit and, and you suffer the fire hose that is my Twitter profile. So you see me banging on about it yep. here and there. <laughs> but, um, God knows what's coming up on there next. But yeah, I think the, the green tech angle is something obviously I'm super passionate about. And I think there's there's a lot more people starting to notice that we can we can really do something about this because I, I forgot all the numbers, but like the internet is the, um, 2%, 4% of global emissions. Like it's, it's growing. It's the same as flying and getting worse. Yeah. And of that like 80 five percent is api traffic and so if we can like yeah. put a little dent in that just by helping people realize they should they could have cached something where they weren't thinking about it before like that that seems pretty helpful especially if you can show a graph going down you can even have people selling carbon credits off the back of it or something or at least <laughs> yeah. kind of that at least their company can pat themselves on the back for doing it but yeah making yeah, making exactly. those emissions go down is a good thing cool what i've found is that a lot of developers only understand certain levels of caching so uh, a lot of the questions I get asked all the time, because I do lots of tutorials and live streams and that sort of stuff, is how can I properly cache? You know, how can I enable caching on my API or on my application? And it's like, well, it depends on what, you, what your application does. Yeah, you, know, you need to build out a cache strategy to understand that and understand kind of some of the business logic to know what you can cache and for how long. But it seems that there's a big lack of well, a big gap of knowledge just missing in in some areas where people don't understand how to cash. Yeah, which yeah, again I, I feel would really guilty. help on that green front, right? Absolutely, I feel guilty because I've not really talked about it enough myself on the blog. We've done a, a blog post about how clients can implement caching with with client middlewares on their end, but like we've not really talked about how to do it particularly well for the back end. And other other people have, but yeah, I feel like I should be doing more there. Uh, I was going to say something and I totally forgot. God damn it. I'm just looking out the window and I'm seeing an invasive cherry laurel that I want to cut down, but it's not on my property and it's distracting <laughs> me. Something, something green tech. Yeah, that was it. It's the green, green make, making your APIs like greener is a really interesting topic that, I mean, when it comes to the front end, if you see all of the green software foundation and all the green tech people, they're for the front end, they're basically giving you all the same advice they would give you to make your website faster. There's nothing particularly different yeah. in there. Like for the front end, it's literally, you know, easy load images when you're scrolling and try and like make your requests smaller and more cacheable and blah, blah, blah. And it's, you know, yeah. not squish them all into one request because that just means that every, if you change anything, you have to blow the whole lot away and different pages have more information than they need, blah, blah, blah. But it's all the same advice as making it faster, making it greener, kind of the same thing. And then when it comes to API design and development, it always seems like making the API faster just means spinning up more instances all around the world and then like <laughs> doing yeah. doing things over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, but from like nearer. And, <laughs> yeah. and so, yeah, like anyone who can help people realize that that's not the case is going to get a big thumbs up from me. Yeah. We're currently investigating what we can do with uh, Cloudflare workers at the minute. So, uh, you know, part of the part of the process with Treble is that you send that payload to us. Now, if we can move that us closer to you, that means it's going to be a quicker response time. It's going to be less network traffic, less carbon footprint by sending it closer instead of, you know, where our servers are located somewhere in America or somewhere else, you know? Yeah. If I'm doing that from rural Wales, where I am, then, you know, it's just quite quite a distance. I've got to send that payload, which, yeah, I could reduce that traffic by using edge locations a little bit more. So we're looking into all of those different ways that we can really reduce 
you know the the latency and that payload and that what we can do with it brilliant i look forward to finding out more about that uh, i was going to ask because we've we've asked you a whole bunch of stuff about treble but i know that you've done lots of other api stuff so you were working on you invited me to a live stream that i think i didn't make it to but you've also done like a video series on building apis with laravel Can you tell us tell yep. us more about that yeah, so I'm actually working on another video series at the moment called API Masterclass in Laravel. So going from I've never built not I've never built an API before, but I've built an API, but let's be honest, I can't really call it an API. I can call it a JSON interface to my database. Uh, I'm gonna go from where that would be to building something that is better, going, you know, going through API design, what's important, actually understanding the process behind why you have an API, what the API is for, caching, you know, building up effective queries around it and that sort of stuff. That is underway. Nice. I'm tempted to lead that into a book because, yeah. but, you know, we, we've spoken a few times, Phil, about me, me releasing an API book uh, as an updated API who won't hate specifically for Laravel to stop the yeah. questions for you. Not allowed. There can only be one book about APIs. No one else can do <laughs> any API books. Well, um, my, my book's going to be called APIs Phil Won't Hate, so it's okay. <laughs> nice. I was uh, joking the other day that the Build APIs You Won't Hate was the dumbest name for a book because it's not about whether you like it or not. It's about whether your clients do. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, there's a mistake in my book name. Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, the the book that I did was like how to build REST-ish APIs with Laravel anyway. It's pretty so, short, yeah. I've got an idea, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You had a whole box of them at one point. Um, yeah, no, I, I finally managed to give all of those out. Fantastic. You're just giving them away on the street corner. You can put mugs on it. It's great. Yep. Use it as a doorstop. <laughs> uh, awesome. But yeah, no, I like the idea of there being a specific for Laravel up-to-date book because, yeah, it, it's really hard to, like, any... Writing about APIs should be polyglot. It should be completely agnostic yeah. to the to the code in question. But people don't just want ethereal concepts wafted in their face for three hundred pages. So you they need to actually cons- pin that. Yeah, they want yeah. code examples. You got to concrete that down. Things they can relate to. Exactly, and not just not just shoving it into a a page. Like, because if I'm yeah, I, I remember like when I was like eleven years old, just like trying to type code that was in a book, and and that is dumb. We don't want that anymore. They want the code in GitHub. And so you have yep. to make it a real thing. And then, you know, Laravel's had four or five, probably more. Are they on Lar- Laravel 10 now? Yeah, Laravel 10 currently. Cool. <laughs> My book was done with like 4.2. So um, yeah, yeah Taylor's, been a, Taylor's been a busy, busy boy. But uh, yes. trying to keep that up to date is hard work. And so, yeah, I think more people should make kind of specific, this is how you do it in this, this sort of language. Uh, that sounds good. So the the video series, the masterclass, you're gonna like build a real API that does actual stuff, or is yep. it is it a Twitter clone? <laughs> what are you doing? No, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna build an actual API, in and it's gonna be I'm gonna have each chapter will be a new branch. So here's mm. where you start, go to that next branch, follow along, go to the next branch, follow along, so you can really understand the journey that you're going on, and yo. Know, by doing it that way, people following along can choose when they want to get off. Like, okay, I'm happy with how far I've gone. I'm going to stick with this for now. I know I've got four more branches to go or four more chapters to go, but for now, I'm happy. I've learned a few lessons, and then they can come back and revisit it to kind of go those further steps because there's a bit of a joke in the Laravel community about me being opinionated with my code. And it's not really, it's, it's not a joke, it's true. I'm probably one of the most opinionated developers you'll find, but it's for a reason. You know, I, I, I like things a certain way. Probably part of my OCD is just rubbing off on my coding standards. So, <laughs> I like know. the idea of somebody in the Laravel community saying that somebody else is opinionated. <laughs> They're yeah. like opinionated by default. So anybody, <laughs> anybody that's sticking out above that has to be really up there fantastic yeah. though opinions do help make things quicker as long as you can get along with those opinions um yeah like a lot of yeah. the frameworks that try to do anyone could do anything in any way that they want then everyone just goes how the hell do i do anything so yeah those yeah, hyper exactly. opinionated <laughs> frameworks really grease the wheels on getting things done sometimes but 
fantastic. Yeah. It's helped us learn a few learn a few lessons over the past mm -hmm. in the industry. You know, by someone formulating an opinion and people adopting that opinion, it means that that's become the new standard. And I suppose that's a little bit how PSRs came about in yeah, the PHP yeah. world. For sure. I mean, I've been using Laravel for the Protect Earth API, and that's that's been a really nice experience. We've got a bunch of Livewire. Well, no, we've got Nova, but we might be switching to Livewire or something. But the API is really slick, and there's an, an amazing community of people as well. We've got like five, six volunteers who just throw code at us and, and enable us to do really nice. useful stuff. And I was saying we've launched the um, we've launched the weather tracking uh, stuff, which is like finding out what the temperature, humidity, and rainfall was, getting that from an API. And then we're talking to another API and finding out what the soil type is in a certain area. And then we can find out, like, when, when we do beat up surveys to find out which ones died, we can we can kind of go, well, we probably shouldn't plant in a, in a place like that. Or if we are going to, we should at least yeah. make sure it's more watered or whatever. And so, yeah, like right now, Laravel is literally saving the world by improving forestry rates. So, <laughs> yep. so uh, it's, it's been, really, been <laughs> really fun to be back in that in that kind of in the community but mostly just using it and, and just it working and me not feeling like i have to get involved with the framework or like bickering because it just works really well and i can just get on with it it's yeah. quite nice hmm. it's definitely i mean I, yeah i've lost my hair but you know that's not laravel's fault that's, <laughs> that's me having the amount of children i do uh, but yeah if, if your children weren't here i'd definitely have long luscious locks like you phil uh, need to get a cut <laughs> Laravel has definitely made development easier, especially in the API space. Yeah, I'm going to start really? blaming Laravel for my uh, lack of coverage here too, I think, even though I've been a JavaScript developer <laughs> for longer than I can think about at this point. That is See, that's funny. just the weight of the NPM modules pulling your <laughs> hair out of your head. <laughs> that's it. Totally, yeah, <laughs> dragging it away from me one, one thread at a time here. So, oh, Steve, what are the things that you're working on now that are coming next, right? Like, I, I know you have maybe some work things, you have... Uh, some personal projects that may be coming. Um, what are you thinking about right now? Right now, uh, oh, that's a very good question. At the minute, I'm, I'm building out SDK tools. I released a new open source package a few days ago called SDK tools. I'm trying to, my second attempt at enabling people to build better SDKs in, in PHP. Um, I'm trying to adopt more PSRs, lots more auto discovery, but still enabling them to keep uh, kind of friendly API and developer experience that might be used to in something like Laravel, for example. That's my current project. It's going well so far. I released it, didn't publish it really. I, I tweeted about it. It's been starred a few times. I've used it twice already, and it, it's it's definitely helped. It's you know. That's my current project because I like integrating with APIs as well as building APIs. So it's always a bit of a, where do I want to focus? Of course. Yeah. It's probably a good sign that you're your own user as well. Uh, you get some of the pains that you're trying yeah. to solve there. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that I say to anybody building an API is, you know, as you're building your API, make sure you're integrating with it so you can feel those pain points that your user will do because that's going to point to where you can improve upon. Yeah, without a doubt. And it was actually what part of my talks I gave at Laracon EU around, I think it was called Building APIs or something like that. They wouldn't let me change the name to Building APIs Phil would like, so... Ah, good. I'm glad it's not just me. It's not just me freezing. I yeah. it. Every, uh, every top puzzle I put in from now on is going to have Phil's name tossed in there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Approved by Phil. So Steve, um, <laughs> appreciate you coming and joining us today. Uh, can you tell us where folks can find you online? Just Steve King, everywhere. Got it. Cool, yeah, and I'll, I'll throw, we have lots of links to you everywhere, uh, which I'll drop in the show notes yeah. here. Um, Treble, where's the best place to go to get started there? Treble.com, T-R-E-B-L-L-E.com. Perfect. Well, Funny spelling, but we're, yeah, we're there. We're uh, Treble API on Twitter. We're always tweeting always awesome well thank you so much for telling us about all of those cool things that treble are working on and you're working on i want to keep an eye on them yeah and uh, on the subject of sdk stuff I've, i'm writing and the latest book surviving other people's apis i know i've mentioned it in the past i am i am yeah. honestly working on it very very quickly now i've done i've finished three chapters in three days and so nice. people should check that out because it's not just 
if you're a front-end developer, but it's any API that talks to other APIs. So anyone that talks to APIs, which should be most of you, uh, this, this book should be right up your alley, and it talks about SDKs a fair bit because half of the stuff that you have to know in order to successfully interact with an API can be done by the SDK so you don't have to. Otherwise, you just have to build an SDK for every API that you ever talk to every time, and that's yep. probably going to be bad. So, uh, yeah, brilliant. I look forward to your your stuff about SDKs, and I'll, I'll shove it in the yeah. book if it's out in time. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Sweet. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to go and get back out into the woods. I've got invasive species to hit with an axe. Enjoy the trees. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Right on. Thanks for joining, Steve. Thanks very much for having me. Take care. Take care.